Today we are reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Come to the table of love. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this is the last in our worship series for this month of inviting people to tables, inviting people to be present, inviting people into Advent. May you continue to open the ears and hearts of our understanding and our seeing and our sight and our knowing, our knowledge and our wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to the last of our worship series, inviting people to the table. We have seen a lot of homes uh, from different members. And so just up front, I want to mention, I was supposed to mention back at the welcome, one of the tables that was being shown today was a table from uh, Miss Bell Scott's home. And her table was set up with uh, advent candles, uh, a beautiful table. Um, and she was able to send in a picture, and so I just want to thank, uh, actually I want to thank all of the people that sent tables uh, to us uh, this season. We got plenty of tables, and we got good responses, and thank you, Ms. Bell. And also, I will go on in this sermon to mention two more tables that came to us. So we're so appreciative. Today I begin talking about the table sent to us by Cal and Ann Audrain. They have been around this church for many years, as I know that many of you in our congregation have seen a few Christmases and have been on this journey for a while. And so today we share the table that they shared with us. Anne says that this table has lived through four children and nine grandchildren. It's been eaten on, climbed on, played on, hidden under, and been a ship, a house, a barn, and integrated into many other imaginary settings. The table has lived in four states and many houses and apartments. Cal adds this about this table's origins. One summer when I was in college, I worked for the Pacific Gas and Electric Company in Northern California, digging ditches in a new subdivision. They were installing hardwood floors and tossing the scrap pieces out in the yard. I gathered up a bag full of scraps and took them home. 
I took an old piano bench and covered it with the scraps and we used it as a coffee table. So there you have it. There's much love around this table and many of the tables that have been shared with us. I was reminded this week as I met with the 2030 group about how many special tables we have been invited to sit around. Barrett led our discussion and he asked us to think about Christmases that had been special to us. Many of us recalled past Christmases with families around tables. Barron mentioned his yearly trip with his mother's family. If you don't know that about Barrett, who is a member of our congregation, um, his family lives in Virginia, but his mom's family lives up in Pennsylvania. And so every year at Christmas time, they would gather all their Christmas gifts. Uh, this year they mailed them. They would gather all their Christmas gifts and load up in the car and drive up to Pennsylvania. And there were truckloads of people but he remembers the family and how much fun it was to be around all of his mom's relatives gathered under one roof. Likewise, I have fond memories of my grandmother. She was the matriarch of our family and she would make all these delicious meals and it was amazing to me. She didn't have a cookbook. She didn't have to look up and see how many cups of flour. She would just put stuff together and she would create a miracle. And by the time we were gathered to eat, we couldn't touch anything until we stood together hand in hand and we prayed for each other. We prayed for the season and we prayed for the meal that we were about to receive. We thanked God. We thanked God for all that God had done for us. And we were together long into the night. For us, as we reflected at 2030, those were some of the best Christmases, and I'm sure that some of you can reflect on Christmases too. Our members, one of our members talked about her first Christmas here in Chicago. She was from the South and her and her husband had moved up here to get a new start. It was their first Christmas in Chicago, and she did the best she could to decorate up their little apartment. And she cooked this fine meal. And then on Christmas Day, her and her husband sat at the table and they blessed the table. And then it hit her. She had often been around the table with many and lots of family and none of them were present. This was her first Christmas without her family. And she cried and she cried and she cried. And so that meal and that Christmas was a bust. But after that, she got pregnant and had kids, and she began to invite other people that might be away from their family. And her table grew and grew and grew because she would invite anyone that she thought didn't have a place for Christmas. And her kids took her example, and they did the same. Now, if you are just joining us, we are talking about tables. We are talking about tables of love. Do you remember some of the tables that you have sat at in your lifetime? Those tables that brought laughter and brought joy. The people now and then whose lives connected so intimately with yours. Those are sweet times and yet they're bitter times because some of these folks are not with us who meant the world to us. The United Church of Christ has invited many people to tables too. A minute ago, we used to gather over in the fellowship hall and we would talk to one another and that was important. And some people in our church took it to heart and challenged us that that was important. When we would get into arguments about who's gonna bring the food or what was gonna be on the table, some of our members reminded us that it wasn't about the food, but it was about us gathering around tables to talk to one another to connect with one another, to talk to visitors who had joined us. We have gathered around tables to talk. We have gathered around tables to have church meetings. We have gathered around tables to have workshops and series to explore the direction our church is headed and where we would like to go. We have gathered around tables to write men in prison. We have gathered around tables to host community forums. We have gathered around tables to have some hard conversations. Sometimes we have left those tables heated and disturbed. 
but then we came back to those tables. We have gathered around tables to say happy birthday to you and to share a meal once a month. This table gathering business was important and is important to the fabric of our church. And I bet if I invited you listening today to share stories, we would be in church for a while as we recall the stories of how we have been invited to tables where there was lots and lots of love flowing from each other to one another. Love finds us at tables. Love finds us when we gather at tables. One of my friends, David Holston, shared recently, he was at a conference. He had gotten there, and this was more or less a two-day conference. And as an orderly man, he had a shirt for certain occasions. And so he realized when he was looking for a shirt, he couldn't find the shirt. But he not only couldn't find the shirt, he couldn't find his luggage. He began to get a little bit worried, and he called home to his wife, and he says, I think I might have left my luggage at home. Well, his wife looked around the house and confirmed for him, in fact, he had left his luggage. So he said to her, well, you know, I'm a little over two hours away. I'll come back when the meetings are over tonight and retrieve my luggage. Well, he didn't think no more of it. That afternoon, late afternoon, he was gathered around a table, and him and his friends were having a heated conversation, and in walks his wife. Well, he's surprised. He says, if you know my wife, this is not something that my wife does. So she comes in, and he's wondering why, you know, wow, I can't believe that my wife bought my luggage. So she comes over to the table, and the friends are shocked to see her, too, because they know his wife as well. And so they turn to her, and they greet her, and they says, why? Well, you know, what brings you here? And she says, at that moment, without missing a beat, I came to get a booty call. Well, there was a pause, but then the table erupted in laughter, but my friend David turned beet red. You see, love finds us at tables, no doubt. It frowned my friend at a table, and it knocked him over and left him speechless. Now that's love. Tables are important spaces, spaces that we are invited to, spaces where love finds us. Around them all wonderful things can occur. Love finds us, but sometimes it takes prayer and it takes thought and it takes work to invite people to tables. Today in our text, there are not so many tables, but an invitation by God to Mary to be the mother of Jesus. Some feminists will say it's not like Mary had a choice here. I mean, it was kind of like she was put in a hard situation. And I imagine we do have to push back on the text and see, if, and see what there is to see here. We have to see that the plight of women prior to the birth of the women's right movement wasn't so great. As readers of the text, we have to hear what has been written and in between and behind the text to understand more fully what is going on in the text. I imagine this pregnancy is bittersweet as scandal has broken loose and Mary is being imposed upon to be the baby machine for God's vision. But I also think something else is going on here. I think God invites Mary to a table of possibility. <clears throat> I think that at first it seems a bit daunting what Mary is being asked to do, but I think then in this worship series that we have been trying to reflect on the fact that peace and joy and faith take some work. They're not just ours for the taking. Here, table meeting experience with God. At first, the thing God is inviting us to do seems hard. And how many of us have felt like we were imposed upon by God? But then, as I reflect upon this, it is possible. In the text today, it says nothing is too hard. It is possible with God. Invitations to tables are powerful. The research for church attendance of visitors and participation still show that the number one top factor for people getting involved and coming to church is personal invitation. When people invite people 
to come to the table, not text messages, not Facebook, not websites, but personal invitations that invite people to come to the table. And Mary is personally invited to come to the table to serve. We get invited, but more importantly, it is important for us to invite people to tables. Our second table today was shared by Mary Lynn Parrish. It is a table with lots of goodies on it. I love tables with goodies on it. I can't be the only person that likes tables with good food and good stuff on it. If you look in the background, you'll see Denise with her hands. She's shaking her head right now. <laughs> this might be a surprise to her. And she's showing much expression. Well, every year, maybe not all of you know it, but on New Year's Eve, Mary Lynn hosts a party for single mature women. I hear it is quite the party to get an invitation to, but you can't come unless you get an invitation. It is by invitation only. And I can only imagine from Denise Pose what happened at this party. But you know what I've been told? What happens at Mary Lynn's house stays at Mary Lynn's house. I think it's pretty cool that Mary Lynn has created a space in her home to invite single mature ladies. I remember last year when Marsha had her surgery, Mary Lynn went over her house and helped her to get ready, picked her up, took her to a party, had the party, and then after the party was over, took her home and helped her to get ready for bed. Wow. So inviting people to table is hard work. It's thought. It's prayer. And there's lots of love at the table. We are not only invited to tables, but we are challenged to invite other people to tables that don't always get invited to tables. Wei Jin reminded me when we were meeting this week, a lot happened in the 2030 meeting as well. He reminded me of the late Ted Jennings, professor of, professor of theology at Chicago Theological Seminary. Ted Jennings, I believe, loved partying as much as he loved teaching. But something he did very unique is he created a table of inviting international students to come over. And when there were holidays and when they were far from home, he would create this wonderful table where he hosted international students. Wei Jin was one of the beneficiaries of his invitation. A former pastor of mine one year said to me, hey, I want you to find some seminary students who have no place to go for Easter and invite them to my home. That wasn't hard to do because at my seminary every year we had three international students that would come over for one year. I reached out to all three of the international students and every one of them said yes. And we went over to my pastor's home and they cooked a meal, him and his wife. And I remember how each international student felt so special, how they had such pride. And I wonder where they would have been had no one even thought to invite them. You see, it's not only important that we come to the table, it's not only important that we invite others to the table, but that we take time as a justice-loving mercy church to think about people who don't get invited to tables. This week, Open Breakfast made sandwiches for people in the night ministry. That's people that live outside in the cold, in harsh elements. That's people who have no tables at all to eat around. And we are continuing to pray as a church and as a ministry about how God might open our eyes to care and to invite people to table even when there are no tables. You see, this journey of serving and loving others is ongoing. Tables can be literal, but sometimes it is like the invitation that is given to Mary to live into the greatness of being a part of a beloved community that proclaims love is greater than anything else. Love is greater than capitalism. Love is greater. Love not only invites us to this table, but love compels us to create tables to invite others. And never think that your table is too small because your table is powerful. Love finds us at tables, we're reminded. 
We are invited to tables, and when we come to those tables, love finds us, and we get to create community when there are no tables. Our love knows no bounds. We are the United Church of Hyde Park, and we should say that proudly. You know, sometimes people are outside, and they're so proud. They're proud to go to the University of Chicago, or they're proud to be a Lakers fan. Well, we ought to be proud to be the United Church of Hyde Park, because this is a place where we declare that love is the greatest, that even in COVID times, we are still united, we are still staying together, and we are still finding ways to gather around tables and experience community and to think about people who have no tables at all. So my title today was, What Has God Done For Us Lately? That was bold, and I was living it up when I came up with it, and then God took me in another direction. But I say to you, God has been inviting many of us to tables all of our lives. God has had us on God's mind. I hope some of those memories found you today, the tables that God invited you to, the tables that you have been around. May that love find you and may it maybe even threaten to turn your face red. God invites us to live into our full potential even when it makes us uncomfortable, even when we think we can't possibly do it, because nothing is too hard for God. And with God, all things are possible. And in turn, we are invited to invite others to the table because we know what it feels like when we haven't been invited to tables. We're invited to open our hearts and our homes and our tables we are invited to share our resources like ham and mayonnaise and cheese for those who don't have tables. We are going to be creating more meals in January, so please leave a message if you want to sign up or you want to be a part of that. And you know what the most awesome thing is? We don't just get to do that for Christmas. As followers of Christ, we get to do it all year. We can be generous all year. We can invite people to tables all year. We can dress our tables up all year. May you remember the lessons that have been taught at your table. I remember the first table we shared, Kara. I remember all the tables we shared this month. And I know you guys have some rich stories. May those stories find you and may they overwhelm you. And may you not only be reminded of the memories, may the joy spring forth as you live into the new year inviting people to tables. And you, may you cease every opportunity to invite someone to the table. And may we continue to create communities so that no one is left behind and no one is not invited to a table. What has God done for you lately? God has done a lot. May you do a lot for others. And may it begin with extending an invitation, inviting people to the table. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you that through the years, as one looks back, one can be overwhelmed with your presence one can be overwhelmed with your glory. One can be overwhelmed with all the spaces and ways you have been present in our life. We thank you for the richness of blessings. We thank you for tables that bring people together. We thank you for this call that you have on our life to extend invitations to tables. One day we are going to get back together and we are going to be in the fellowship hall and we are going to sing happy birthday and we are going to come to tables. But until that time, we are going to gather on Zoom calls. And we are going to pick up the phone and we are going to text and we are going to find all the ways possible to come to tables. Lord, may you be with us. May you especially be with those in the world that don't have a table. Thank you for inviting us to this table. Thank you for inviting us to this table of joy and 
faith and peace and hope. And we thank you that we are loved by you because it is only after being loved by you, God, that we even have an idea of how to love others. Thank you for this table of plenty, even in the midst of scarcity. Thank you for the birth of Jesus. Thank you for the upcoming year, but thank you for this year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.